Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Jerzy Kijowski on our uh, on our colloquium, weekly colloquium. Uh, I think there is no need to introduce Professor Kijowski here. Uh, we will have a, a talk on the pedestrian version of the Troutman. Uh, Bondi energy, which I understand is related to gravitational waves and the energy emitted to, to infinity. Professor Kioski, the ground is yours. Could you dim the light? Uh, read not, but I can switch them off. Okay. I would like to say that the most of the, no, no, that this material is uh, contained in my one of my publications a few months ago, and Everybody who would like to have more insight may go to our web page. Then you have to find about us, then employees, find my name, and then you have access to my publications. So gravitational waves were discovered two years before, before the laser yeah because i always claim that the laser had been uh, discovered by einstein in 1918 and two years before he had uh, discovered einstein uh, the gravitational wave he used the linear version of general relativity and uh, derived his famous quadrupole formula for uh, <coughs> Uh, for the energy radiated. So the linear version means that the uh, metric tensor was considered to be the flat Minkowski metric plus some small perturbation and uh, Einstein equations were uh, considered up to linear terms in H, roughly speaking. However, later on, Einstein began to have doubts about the validity of, of such an approach, and these doubts can be easily illustrated on a, an example which I have taken, not stolen, but taken from uh, the paper by Paweł Murowski, namely, consider such a apparently very complicated metric tensor, which is of this form, namely it is a flat <coughs> Einstein, uh, sorry, uh, Minkowski metric, plus something which looks like a plane wave uh, traveling uh, in the direction of X axis. However, if you choose a new variable, T tilde, then immediately uh, you immediately discover that in fact it is an entirely flat space, Minkowski space, in this and this apparent wave uh, is due to the choice of of, uh, of the complicated time uh, coordinate. So the main difficulty here in description of, of waves is somehow <clears throat> consists in uh, the problem how to decouple those uh, this gauge freedom from the true degrees of freedom. Uh, in uh, 20s and early 30s, Einstein had written a couple of papers at least three of them, because I was uh, uh, asked by Professor Troutman to, to read this paper and to give a seminar. It was in the 60s, I believe, a long time ago. And these papers were, excuse me, idiotic. Einstein was great, but he really struggled. He tried to somehow to calculate how many independent degrees of freedom is carried by them, and he totally failed. <clears throat> now, of course, we, uh, due to many researchers, we 
know how to do it. But at that time, he was unable to do it, and nobody was able. And finally, in 37, you probably know that Einstein has proved that gravitational waves do not exist. Proved in quotation mark because this, of course, his conclusion was uh, false. But at this point, the sociologically, a red light what was put on any research of uh, on gravitational waves, which means that serious people did not believe in gravitational uh, waves, serious people, including Leopold Infeld. But nevertheless, one of his PhD students, namely Andrzej Trautmann, in his PhD thesis, was able to give fundamental conceptual framework for the description of uh, of uh, gravitation wave <clears throat> in, in, in his, actually uh, his PhD thesis was 58 later on he published another paper in 60 where he improved something but still it was very complicated but it is valid also uh, nowadays, and what I am, uh, ah, first of all, uh, his conclusions may be summarized as follows. First of all, radiation is not a local phenomenon. If you are here, you cannot divide the rotational field in a part which is somehow attached to the sources and a part which will be uh, radiated. No. It is a, not a local phenomenon. It takes, uh, it happens at infinity, whatever it means, and boundary conditions are fundamental. Whenever you ask, uh, you, you say to Angie, I had uh, very good contacts during many years with Angie Younger, whenever Somebody wants to say, ah, Professor Troutman, you did a great thing. So he, is, he was very modest, man. He says, no, I have only uh, generalized Sommerfeld radiation conditions from uh, electrodynamics to, 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 general, to special relativity. And in a sense, it is true. However, it was a great success, in my, my opinion. Uh, his uh, Trautmann's description uh, sure, excuse was, me. but his points one and two and three are also true for uh, electrodynamics, right? No, of course, of course, of course. For any kind of radiation, yeah. Uh, in uh, thirty, in sixty-four, because uh, after uh, sixty, many, many uh, relativists. Uh, have worked on 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 this Troutman's uh, approach, and uh, substantial progress was done by Roger Penrose, who introduced some treatment of infinity. Nowadays, the, the Penrose uh, approach is uh, a classical subject. I will summarize it very very briefly because, after all. Uh, what I'm going to tell you today is to show you another approach, which I believe is much better than the uh, Penrose approach. It doesn't. Penrose is great, no doubt about it. But I think that his picture may be uh, simplified, and this is. What I'm going to tell. Okay, so Penrose picture. Everybody who uh, studied general relativity knows this this uh, picture. So here, uh, our space time is symbolized by the points inside inside of this rectangle. So the Penrose method consists in adding to, uh, adding to our uh, space-time a boundary, 
which is symbolically summarized, this boundary is mainly three-dimensional uh, manifold. It is go called nowadays scry. <laughs> we pose, we know where does it come from, but of course, no, it is simply script I. I would like to, uh, to uh, point out that the name Ukraina contains the same root. Crime, crime. Okay, but leaving this joke aside, uh, this uh, um, the boundary of space time contains also <coughs> singular points, namely future timeline infinity. In quotation mark, you may say that this is a common endpoint of all uh, time-like uh, trajectories. <clears throat> Moreover, it, there is a, a, a space-time infinity, again, a common uh, endpoint of all space-like surfaces. More they, um, uh, moreover, it is a past null infinity, which is in a sense symmetric to future null infinity and also past timeline infinity. And the main conclusion of Troutman's research was that to each two dimensional slice of the scry of this uh, boundary of space-time, you may assign a, a certain uh, amount, uh, certain number, which uh, describes the amount of energy, which, in quotation mark, was not yet been radiated. I will discuss this later in some, um, in my approach. And this is the so-called troutman bondi energy. And uh, it is virtually unknown to physicists which are not, who are not relativist. And even in, uh, in uh, textbooks in uh, general relativity, it is very complicated. It is very complicated. <clears throat> Roughly speaking, this approach uh, can be applied only for non-massive pins with vanishing charges, because uh, for massive pins, it, uh, you cannot uh, collect all the time-like uh, curves into a single points. You have to, some, in a sense, blow up. This is a mathematically rigorous terms. You have to blow up those points. However, today we are going to talk about non-massive fields. Therefore, this <clears throat> compactification is sufficient. And this uh, Penrose approach is based on introducing the fictitious metric at infinity. We know that at infinity there is no metric because the distances at infinity are, are infinitely great, therefore there is no metric. But Penrose proposes to uh, split the real physical metric into something which is finite at infinity and a certain um, scalar function which goes uh, tends to infinity, which means that omega itself tends to zero at infinity. So the, using this fictitious metric, we uh, can um, perform and simplify some uh, calculations which were done by uh, Trauma. However, this procedure is um, not unique. The introduction of this uh, function is absolutely non unique. You have to introduce the so called only coordinates non in, at infinity. Uh, this non uniqueness is related with, with such phenomena as 
the so called super translation, super rotation, very, very difficult. I mean, not conceptually, but technically. Excuse me, but what about vanishing charges for photon screen? Uh, in electrodynamics, for instance, yeah. yeah. But for gravity? Uh, gravity but for, also for gravity. In a sense, also for gravity. I will explain this later. So, um, uh, no, um, roughly speaking, the uh, um, Past scry uh, is used to describe uh, to, to describe incoming radiation, and this is used to describe uh, outgoing radiation. Uh, in uh, 2001, we have written together with my two former uh, PhD students a book, which was uh, written, uh, which was published by Springer. Where we have simplified a lot of things. However, I was never happy with that. What I am uh, telling you today is uh, different. So the same, the same story, but in an entirely new, much simpler formalism. I would like to stress that radiation the behavior of radiation is universal in a sense. For example, electrodynamics outside, very far away from sources, can be described by exactly the same equation like uh, gravity and so on. In asymptotic regime, dynamics of gravitational field becomes linear. There are just two decoupled wave equation. And the same applies to electrodynamics. So, okay. Therefore, let us consider just a wave equation. So most, most of my talk today will be devoted to the description of wave equation in a flat metric, uh, flat Minkowski space. Every solution of a wave equation is uniquely determined by initial data or Cauchy data. So if you know the value of this solution at time zero, and moreover, <clears throat> the, it's the time derivative, which plays the role of the momentum canonically conjugate, then there is a formula which is very often called the Huygens formula, which tells you how to calculate unambiguously the value of the solution at uh, time t, and it works uh, in both uh, time uh, increasing time direction and decreasing, because these uh, two directions are totally symmetric. What does it mean? This uh, symbol means Whenever I have three-dimensional function, because this is, is initial value, this is a four-dimensional function, this is three dimensional. Whenever I have a three-dimensional function, this symbol means that I take the mean value, this mean, means mean value of this function on a sphere which is centered at point X and whose radius, radius must be always positive, is the modulus of T. It works for both positive and negative T. And this precisely, this is the rigorous formulation of what we are teaching children in the elementary school or junior high school, maybe, that the propagation of wave is such that every point where the uh, wave arrives uh, becomes a source of a new um, spherical wave. And the, the resulting wave is just the superposition of all those waves. The, and the rigorous formulation of this 
slogan is written here. What does it mean? It means that if we uh, have initial value, this symbolizes the t equal zero three dimensional space. So if I want to know what will be the value of the solution of wave equation at this point, what I must do? First of all, I, uh, I will surely use this uh, formula. So first of all, I go back to time t equals zero. Then I choose a sphere with the uh, radius equal to t. And then I, I integrate, then I make some other uh, manipulations, but after all, it means that I collect the information about Cauchy data over this sphere. So this is the only thing that you have to remember during my talk. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, when you read Penrose's formulation of, of this compactification, then uh, the scry, the point of the scry, I always uh, represent it as, as endpoints of a light ray. So uh, choose a light ray and let us think which kind of information can be assigned to the endpoint of a light ray. The first approach would be just take the value of the solution and go to infinity. But this is stupid. The, the information is irrelevant because it is zero. But it turns out that if you, before going to the limit, if I first multiply by R, then the information is relevant. And actually, this information assigned to all points of, of, uh, of the sky contains the entire information of the, uh, about the field. And what is a fourth argument to this problem? Five and three. <laughs> Ah, Z X I X. <laughs> excuse me, I have put Z as the first. Yeah, because the, the function depending on uh, four uh, coordinates, X and Y I have put zero, mm -hmm. R equal to Z and T equal. Ah, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. This is time. Time is. R, sorry, time. X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, okay. So what does it mean? How do I calculate this value? Huh? I take a point on the light ray and I calculate this value, which means that I have to integrate something over this sphere. Because what I know is only uh, the collection of uh, initial data. Yes? Now, the same, however, I must, I integrate over a bigger sphere. Now, even bigger, and even bigger, and even bigger, and at the limit, I finally must integrate over the limit of the spheres, namely, but of course, in order to have a finite limit and so on, some conditions on the follow-up of, of uh, data must be imposed. In fact, this condition is equivalent to the fact that the initial uh, data carry uh, finite energy. Okay, now to, to further analyze what does it mean, let us intro, ah, ah, sorry. First of all, observe that actually the same, the same quantity must be obtained when I uh, choose another light ray. Why? Because the theory is invariant with respect to uh, space shift, 
Therefore, if I integrate over X and Y, then that nothing changes if I um, shift the zero in this two-dimensional space of uh, X and Y, yeah? So we, this simply means that actually this value is not assigned to a single light ray, but to the entire collection, collection of them. This entire collection is nothing but the three-dimensional uh, null hyperplane. Null hyper. And this is correct. Why? Because how many uh, light rays have we? From each point of the three dimensional surface, we may put, uh, we may uh, choose a light ray in one of two dimensional directions, which means that if the amount of light rays is five dimensional, but the uh, scry is three dimensional. Which means that in uh, Penrose picture, all those rays end up in, at the same point. But for this purpose, you, you have to, to use this fictitious metric. But here, I, so I have a tendency to say that what is a pay, uh, point of a uh, light ray? Of a, of a scry. A point of a scry is simply a three dimensional null hypersurface. And now, in order to analyze what is this value which is assigned uh, to, 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 to this point of a scry, let us choose those uh, light ray like coordinates, namely u equal time minus z and v equal time plus z. Using these coordinates, the, uh, the wave equation can be written in this way. This is just a trivial observation. Now, let us integrate this equation over this two-dimensional surface. So what we, uh, of course, these two terms do not uh, give any, any uh, non-trivial value because the uh, integration of, of the derivative is some boundary value at infinity. And if we assume that the, uh, initial data vanish sufficiently fast at infinity <clears throat> that we did. So the only term which we get after integration is this term. So we uh, ob uh, obtain the following that if we take the derivative of the of our solution of a wave equation with respect to this u, u with respect to that, and integrate it over this two-dimensional surface, then it does not depend upon the uh, variable v, which means that it doesn't matter whether, uh, and then it just turns out, it is a matter of simple calculation, that this integral is precisely the value which we have uh, defined previously, this uh, limit at infinity. So this, this observation tells us that, in fact, it doesn't matter whether we integrate here or there or there or here. It doesn't matter. It is simply a value, a number, which is assigned to this three-dimensional null-like surface. Now, let us try to parameterize this um, scribe, which means how to parameterize the collection of all three-dimensional null-like 
planes in in Minkowski space. Oh, first of all, I'm sorry, but why ask what, what is null? Pardon me? Null plane. Plane, because it, what you say, null, 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 because null, because it is uh, done uh, by light rays, which means that three-dimensional metric is degenerate. No, that's this this oh, direction is degenerate. Yeah. So, uh, in order to parameterize this collection, which means, in my language, to parameterize the the sky, first of all, choose a time axis. Well, this one I have chosen the time axis. Now, an intersection, a unique intersection of this null hypersurface with this, my time axis will, will be one parameter among three. Now, once we have uh, chosen that, choose this particular, we know that this null hypersurface is a collection of light rays, choose the one which starts from this point of intersection. So now to parameterize uh, this hypersurface, it is sufficient to parameterize the direction of this light ray. Yeah, this direct, and this is parameterized by two angles, which means that, for example, if this is the initial uh, time, take another time, tau plus one, so intersect and take the light ray, uh, sorry, take the uh, light cone, cone, the light cone starting from this point, the light cone. Uh, this is a sphere, and every point of this sphere corresponds to one singular. Yeah? And our surface is just tangent to this light ray. So I, I skip further uh, conclusions. In any case, coordinate system on the sky is three dimensional. One uh, variable which is just a real variable. It goes from infinity, from minus to plus infinity, and other are just spherical coordinates. <laughs> Once this is fixed, the, uh, this coordinates describe what the astronomers call a celestial sphere, the directions. Now, a theorem, which I'm not going to, to prove, but it is relatively easy. It is not um, in very difficult course. First of all, the part of this theorem I have already pronounced for you, that the Cauchy data and the radiation data on the sky contain precisely the same information. When I know initial data, I have shown you how to calculate boundary uh, the radiation data. But the inverse inverse uh, uh, mapping is relatively easy to imagine because you remember that in order to get this from that, you had to integrate initial data over two-dimensional sub. Uh, spaces. So this is uh, something like a Radon transformation, which, for example, is used in tomography. Mm -hmm. And we know that Radon transformation is inverted. And we know Radon transformation, when the machine knows the Radon transformation, the computer is able to, to provide the correct image of your, of your stomach. For instance, yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So, but this is only a half of the story. Another half 
even more important is that both of those spaces carry a natural canonical structure, which I like very much to uh, describe in terms of uh, two forms, symplectic two form, but there will be a version for those who prefer to use um, Poisson brackets. Okay, so the uh, Cauchy data carry this structure, which simply means that uh, this pi are momenta canonically conjugate to, to phi. This is the uh, whenever you open any textbook in quantum field theory, it begins with classical field theory, for example, Bogolubov Shirkov, and this story is uh, nicely described. But now, what about radiation? Radiation data also carry this. Uh, so this is a symplectic form. I will discuss it later. Uh, the integration here is three dimensional, and also here the integration is three dimensional because we must integrate over this uh, parameter which runs from minus to plus infinity, but also uh, over a sphere. And this d mu uh, is a, my notation for this measure on S2, which is, of course, physically totally uh, fictitious because at infinity the distances are, are great and the, the measure is infinite. Okay. Uh, so. The two structures can be treated as different representation of the same phase space describing feed configurations. What about uh, processes which are not accompanied by radiation? You can have a Cauchy data and evolution, but no radiation at all. Like the charge there is which is radiation. There is a, for uh, mass zero. <clears throat> you have a radiation and uh, where there are sources i will tell them how to deal for um, symmetric charge distribution which depends on time does it really yeah if you take any any initial data for a wave equation the total energy yeah, will be radiated yeah, okay. there will be nothing left okay Nothing is left. Everything is always radiated. Only people. If you take, for instance, instead of uh, wave equation, if you take um, the Klein Gordon equation, then it is no longer true. And a similar analysis can be done, but you have to, uh, to, to describe. Uh, time infinity in a much, much complicated. Okay. Whenever you have such a formula, the key point is to find its Lorentz invariance. I have mentioned Bogolubov Shirkov, or take uh, Bionitsky Birula uh, textbook in the electrodynamics. Then, again, at the very beginning of the story, you prove that this structure is uh, Lorentz invariant. At the first glance, this is not Lorentz invariant, but it is. And I will try to convince you. What happens if we, because you remember that every, uh, that this parameterization was based on the choice of a time axis. So what happens if we change the time axis? Ah, the time parameter changes. But this is not very uh, dangerous because we have time here and time here. Therefore, if uh, time um, shrinks, for example, then this expands. And so you can prob probably uh, believe me that this is not very dangerous. 
However, also the change of the volume element on the celestial sphere is substantial because we know how the volume, how the uh, volume element or the surface element on the celestial sphere undergo the uh, boost transformation. It is uh, highly non-trivial transformation. Okay, it's not very difficult to, to describe it, but it is not a trivial transformation. So a priori, it's bad. But also, this value changes. Why? Of course, without this R, it would be the same because we go to infinity and that's all. But due to Lorentz transformation, also the, the length R changes, which means that the value of F changes. So a priori, it looks very bad. Everything changes. But a miracle occurs, namely, if we split this surface element into two square roots, whatever it is, but this is a rigorous mathematical object, namely a half density, a half density. So if you make this manipulation and you, and the, which means that you describe the uh, radiation data not in terms of a scalar, which is not Lorentz invariant, but in terms of a half density, then this remains unchanged. By the way, if you want to understand quantum mechanics in a little bit more geometric way, then of course, uh, all probabilities are used by integration, but to integrate, you have to fix your um, uh, measure. But this measure is not given uniquely. You may, for example, change the units. And again, if you treat wave function not as a scalar, but a, like a half density, then again, everything be a lot of manipulations which at the first glance look look very bad are safe are good you, this is just a very simple change so again if you, i rewrite this in terms of those half densities then i don't need the new here because this the new this, there is square root here and square root of new here therefore this integration is already contained in in f so the only thing it uh, the two dimensional integration is contained okay the evolution of the field is generated by the hamiltonian in cauchy picture this Hamiltonian, everybody knows because uh, you have studied the Hamiltonian is this three-dimensional integral, which may be rewritten like that, and uh, it is manifestly positive. And how it is in uh, radiation? Uh, one answer would be, I just take, express this data in terms of radiation data, and you will get the answer. And this is correct answer. However, I will try to uh, convince you that even without going into these calculations, which are a little bit complicated, we are able to recover this. Because this is radiation. You may, uh, this uh, is the, <clears throat> A formula for symplectic structure. So you may rewrite it and say, ah, the f of the over the tau plays role of the momentum. So you may say that in fact this is dp df with a single difference that there is a, a constraint. So this is a constraint system that the momentum is equal to derivative of the position with respect to time. So if we 
forget about this constraint. So we know that the evolution in uh, this uh, radiation picture is just shift. Everything shift with respect to this time. Therefore, if we want to have this equation equal to uh, to Hamiltonian uh, equations of motion, then you see that H must be equal P D T F, or if you integrate by part, it is minus D T P D F. And you see that this is precisely the same phenomenon which you encounter if in standard field theory you want to describe the moment. What is the moment? It is the generator of the shift. And the momentum is just given by this formula. How, uh, with the, uh, the difference that tau is not the time, but is just the um, space shift parameter. And now at the very end, we remember that uh, P was nothing but the derivative. So we remember that, ah, but it was a constraint system. But this manipulation is correct. It's really correct. Which simply means that finally, this um, the, the formula for the Hamiltonian in the radiation picture is the integral of the square of this of this year. And it is again positive, we are happy. In uh, Cauchy picture, or initial value picture, the time evolution on this uh, 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 Penrose picture looks like that that the subsequent uh, t equal constant surfaces on the Penrose picture look like that, because all of them end up in space infinity, which is a single point. Whereas in um, radiation picture, the evolution is relatively trivial because nothing changes. We are always here on the slide. What only changes is the uh, parametrization, that this time parameter is shifted. And as I told to you, the transformation from initial data to radiation data is a canonical transformation. I have put uh, this uh, uh, exclamation because Ted Newman, who was a great relativist, maybe you know what are Newman Penrose formalism in general relativity, he was very fond of rewriting everything in terms of uh, those boundary data. And if, if uh, in uh, uh, the Hamiltonian is so simple, therefore the quantization in terms of those boundary data is trivial. Do you want to uh, describe, uh, to, to quantize general relativity? Do it immediately. However, the relation between those data and the actual data here is so complicated that it doesn't help us to, to understand what really happens in our galaxy in this quantized picture. Okay, okay let's go. And now, let us describe. Uh, many people tried to consider Cauchy problem on a hyperbola. This picture, when uh, uh, described in a real life, not in the, the Penrose uh, picture, means that what is red is just a surface which 
does end up at space infinity, but it ends up on the sky. And what is green? It, no, no, sorry. Sorry. And what is green describes the radiation, a part of radiation, which happens after that. At the first glance, such a hyperboloid is a, also a good uh, initial surface. But it is not, because if you know uh, the data on a surface, then you may calculate everything forward in time, but nothing backward in time. What is here is absolutely unknown. Therefore, it is not a correct uh, system, but I have invented, because from the very beginning of many years, I was thinking in giving, in giving the meaning to Troutman energy as a Hamiltonian. And for that purpose, I have invented what I call mixed Cauchy radiation picture, namely, take a, uh, the initial data on the hyperboloid plus radiation, but not in the future, but in the past. And it turns out that this is an autonomous Hamiltonian system. Uh, in, uh, in the real life, it means that uh, we take initial data on the hyperboloid plus the radiation which do, took part before. And nowadays, we may solve the uh, initial value problem not only forward in time, but also backward, because this missing part of the information on the hyperboloid is completed by, the, by this information. So this is a, a Hamiltonian system. <clears throat> Therefore, it has a, his, its total Hamiltonian. This total Hamiltonian is a sum of H minus, which is just the amount of energy contained in this radiation data, and the H plus, which is the amount of radiation here. The evolution is something like that that when time goes further, we take into account more and more radiation and the initial data on a smaller and smaller uh, uh, hyper. This is a, uh, an autonomous uh, total system. Therefore, the total Hamiltonian is conserved. But of course, this H minus is uh, of course, increase, strictly increasing because you take into account more and more data. If this is increasing, then this must be decreasing. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this H plus is precisely the Troutman Bondi energy, which for many, many years was called on the energy, but in our book published 20, already 23 years ago, we try to introduce this mm -hmm. terminology, Troutman Bondi, because actually Troutman was the first one who, who used this, uh, who defined this energy, and it seems that it works. Many people for, uh, call it already nowadays uh, Troutman Bondi energy. Uh, yeah, so I am coming to the end. Uh, ah, an important information. In fact, what is the uh, shape of this three-dimensional uh, surface doesn't count. What counts is, is only the intersection point. Therefore, it really doesn't, it, you may check it, that if you take different uh, surfaces, which are, are only asymptotically uh, hyperboloids, but here you may change the, the, the shape 
and the value is the same. Therefore, the, the correct uh, picture is like that. So the, the Troutman Bondi energy, like in original paper by Troutman, is not assigned just to a three-dimensional hyperboloid, but to its intersection and actually to any section of two-dimensional section of the of the uh, oh yeah this is my last slide at the moment i didn't tell you anything about general relativity it is just simple mathematics but it may be applied to general relativity because most of this material i have told you is old i have um, noticed many of those things many many years ago but only recently i have i realized that actually it does apply to general relativity it does apply in the following sense that in <clears throat> what is important are uh, flat asympt asymptotic flat uh, conditions which means that on this picture the, this uh, strong field region is situate is uh, somewhere here and outside it is weak field region which means that outside of this bounded Q work Q uh, uh, what I told you may be uh, applied of course there is some information about what happens here which we see it from outside but actually the, and everything I told you can be applied to such a situation that there are awful things very nonlinear which happens somewhere here in a bounded world too but outside everything is flat okay so what is a, a scribe uh, in in, uh, in uh, nonlinear case there are no hyperplanes in non flat. Yes, but there are asymptotic some uh, three dimensional null hypersurface, which, when we go further and further in time, both in future or in, future or in, in the past, because of course what I have told you about the future may. Be applied also to the past. So there are such null uh, asymptotical null hyperplane, and this may be identified. Um, now, in general relativity, meaningful physical quantities are never defined by volume integrals, by only two surface integrals. Hence, the shape of the, this hyperboloid doesn't matter, like it did not matter also in special relativistic picture. So, what matters is interception, right? Just a technical thing that the energy in times of uh, Troutman was described by a super potential. Actually, this is a very bad object. There are many superpotentials which are available, for instance, Freud or Landau Lipschitz superpotentials. I skip this story, but nowadays we have much better description. And this is the end of my story. The last remark is that all this material can be found in this in this publication which you find on, on my web page thank you okay thank you very much <laughs> for the uh, introduction to this complicated matter now questions uh, go ahead okay i'm not an expert here i have a simple question it seems that the gist of this approach is that you can simplify the uh weather equation along an all Geodesic yeah. Yeah. So, wouldn't it be advisable to try to repeat this construction simply on the set of all null lines? 
and then identify. No, 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 because I simplify only this simplification occurs only after integration okay. over okay. those two uh, space diagrams. Yes, yes, but what can you do some kind of identification? Like I mean, all lines come in the same direction, something like that. It's just a different geometric approach. No, because what happens on this hyperboloid is somehow in, is in any case influenced by the field outside. So maybe you, I don't claim nothing cannot be simplified. Maybe, but I don't see it at the moment. Okay, we are well past the time. So one quick important question. I was first. But please make it. Okay, it, it, it's quick. In the case of cosmology, you have a problem with asymptotical flatness if the model is not asymptotical flat. And this is the well known problem, right? But we observe uh, gravitational waves not at cosmological infinity. But in our infinity, which means that we are far away, well, away from source. Therefore, assuming asymptotic non flatness in cosmological considerations is totally different from what I am doing here. Because I don't consider, uh, I only say that uh, I don't go in, uh, towards cosmological infinity. I only go far away from the source. Point. And uh, where we are, the space time is flat with respect to what happens uh, at the point where those two black holes merge. Okay, I think we finish at this point. <laughs>